Welcome to our lecture on primary research methods, which builds on the last lecture in which we looked at the concepts of discourse community and ethnographic research and writing. Um, again, an ethnographic approach to research and writing involves um, conducting our own research or um, using primary research methods. Probably most of you are most familiar with secondary research, which is when we look at secondhand information or the research of others that has been written into books and articles and so forth. Um, for the final research project, we're going to be using primary research methods and gathering our own data. So first of all, think of a method as a tool for doing research. Um, so a method is a fancy way of saying conducting an observation, conducting an interview, and so forth. Um, it's the approach you use to gathering your data. And the first thing you want to do is when you're thinking about which methods to use, you want to ask yourself, not well, do I feel like conducting an interview or feel like conducting a survey, but what kind of evidence am I looking for? What is it that I want to discover or represent about this culture? Um, we'll talk about this in more detail um, later on in the PowerPoint, um, in the lecture rather, but if you think about the fact that a survey gives you kind of a broad breakdown of how a large group of people might feel about something versus an interview gives you lots of nuance and detail, allows you to collect stories or hear lots of personal opinion, um, you can think of, start to think about how different methods have different results. They give you different kinds of pictures into what's happening at any particular research site. So the first thing you want to do is think about what is it I'm hoping to represent or discover about my research site and that's going to give you a clue as to which methods are going to be most useful. Um, every method has benefits and also has drawbacks. It has things that it can show and things that it can't. And so that's something for you to think about carefully before you go about conducting your research. Because what you, I, I think of methods, at, I think of research, I guess I should say, um, as what, you know, whatever you put into it shapes what you get out of it. So considering your methodological design before you start your research is a really important thing to spend the time doing. So I have a, I have a story where I was um, sitting in a Starbucks off campus and um, just off campus and a student came, someone who clearly was a student who was um, conducting some very last minute research, this was like a Sunday night at like nine o'clock, asked me if he could ask a survey question and I said okay. And he had one sur he only had one question in this survey, and it was, and the question was a multiple choice question. What do I think is the most important issue facing the U.S.? Um, the legalization of marijuana was one. Um, I think one was, uh, you know, I don't even remember what a couple of the others are. And I and I said right away, oh, well, I think the most important thing facing the country isn't on your list. And he said, oh, and kind of got a little flustered, and didn't have anything built into his survey to ask me why that was or to be able to record another response. Um, again, this was just like a one question survey. So clearly this was probably a student who was kind of panicked trying to do some research last minute. And again, you're gonna get out of it what you put into it. So my, I, I have this don't be my Starbucks story slide to kind of illustrate again how you know, you want to be thoughtful about your research and kind of doing it last minute is going to not get you very useful results. So one of the first um, methods you can use and really all of you probably should try to use um, is observation. And one thing to think about with observation is how much you are going to be a participant and how much you're going to be kind of a more distanced observer. Um, and this is a question that, um, you know, you may recall um, reading the Seth Kahn piece. He talked about um, the tensions between participating and observing. And we've kind of talked a little bit about how, um, you know, in ethnograph ethnography's history, um, there, there's always been some danger in, you know, being too, um, too far removed and kind of therefore othering. But then if you're too much involved, that can have its drawbacks too. Um, so there's no one perfect answer. Um, but you want to think about how much you're going to participate and interact with other participants because your participation may alter what's happening. Um, you know, people act differently when someone is 
from the outside is kind of in the room. Um, one example I'm sure we can all relate to is um, when a teacher for any class, um, you know, this happened all through elementary school and high school and so forth, when a teacher is getting observed by a principal, everyone in the room acts differently the day that the pers the observer is there, right? Even if you're kind of told to act naturally, it's kind of hard to you kind of feel like someone is watching the whole time. Um, so think about how something similar might happen when you are participating or observing. Um, just your presence is going to alter what's going on. Um, and your participation may alter things even more so, but also then again, being involved and doing things firsthand may help you to understand what's going on. All things to consider when thinking about what kind of role you want to play. Um, when doing any kind of observation, you want to make sure that you're um, observing your participants doing whatever it is they're doing as naturally as possible. Um, so, you know, try to, um, you know, don't, you know, maybe like allowing them to do what they're doing and coming at the same time instead of having them set up something special for you, for instance. Um, you want them to be kind of, you know, in their everyday environment as much as possible. You also need to think about what you're going to focus on. Um, and by that I mean that you just can't possibly capture everything. Um, even if you record, you know, the camera's got to be pointed one way, um, you're going always going to miss things. So you want to think about beforehand, you want to reflect on, again, those que that question from the beginning, what am I hoping to discover? Because that's going to help you to think about what you're going to focus on with your observation. You might also consider the usefulness of um, conducting several observations because um, it will probably feel more natural to your group as time goes on to have you there and present. When conducting observations, um, the, the main key is to pay attention to as much detail as you can and to keep extremely detailed notes. You may remember from um, Seth Kahn's piece, he mentioned in one class period, and again, think a class period is like less than an hour usually, um, he would take like five pages of handwritten notes. So you want to aim for a lot of detail because you can always then you know, go back through and pare down, but it's harder to remember stuff that maybe wasn't recorded. Another goal I'd say as well is to separate concrete observations from feelings and reactions. Um, and so by that, you know, we've talked about that a little bit, but by that I mean a concrete observation is trying to get to the level of what's observable. Um, and if, and then, you know, at the other end of the spectrum, we get to more interpretation. So instead of saying, you know, this person looked angry, maybe, maybe describe what changed about their countenance or their facial features, right? Trying to get as much down to level of concrete, observable, tangible detail as possible. You also want to consider, I mean, I know it sounds silly at first, but think about it, it makes a big difference how you're going to keep your notes. Um, are you going to use a notebook? Are you going to use a computer laptop? Um, are you going to use a recording device? I have a link here, actually look for the pop-up to the right. Um, I have a link here to um, the library's uh, information on renting out recording equipment. Of course, you can also make use of programs on your laptop or your phone. And if you have questions about good programs to use, I can try to help answer them. Um, but also keep in mind that if you're going to record the observation, then you have to think about how you're going to transcribe or translate it, translate it later on, possibly. Um, I am encouraging you all to um, write in a multimodal way and bring in video and audio clips, but you know, you may have to kind of, you're going to have to still summarize or quote what's going on in written print. So keep that in mind as, you know, a labor thing down the road if you decide to do recording. Um, interviews are another pr uh, primary research method. Um, and one thing to think about when conducting an interview is what kind of format or technology you're going to conduct the interview through. Um, face to face is probably the one I would say I prefer, I prefer most, most researchers prefer most. Um, you're going to have the most naturalistic kind of conversation. Um, you can kind of easily adapt, um, you know, to what's going on in the interview. You know, it's because you can see gestures and facial expressions. You can kind of read the tone there and kind of, you know, make any adjustments necessary. Um, on the other hand, a phone uh, interview 
you know, especially given our limited time, um, maybe easier if your participants are busy and it's hard to get a hold of them. Um, it will be more difficult to record that kind of interaction though versus face to face. You can have a, uh, an audio recorder sitting on the table between you. Um, email is um, highly convenient but it's a lot harder to get details or read tone and getting follow-ups is nearly impossible whereas with face-to-face -face and also with a phone interview you can always ask for more detail or ask someone to explain something further email you don't really have that opportunity so it's kind of a once and done um, and it's you know it's kinda of, might be hard to figure out what they kinda of really mean by something um, online chat is also an option um, Many of you may have noticed that, for instance, Skype, which we use uh, in our class, um, has a chat feature. Um, so that would be something that's adaptable in the way that face-to-face -face and even phone interviews are, where you can ask follow-up questions and that sort of thing, or clarify questions that the participant might find confusing. You know, if you have a, a wor uh, question um, and the wording of it, your participant finds confusing, an email interview um, might be more difficult. But with a chat interview, if your participants have trouble typing quickly, um, that may affect the kind of responses you get. They might be giving you shorter responses because, or even if they don't find typing difficult, but they're kind of feeling a little lazy, right? You know, it's easier to get people to get chatty in person and they just kind of talk and talk. Um, when conducting an interview, um, I would consider recording um, and having a backup. Um, but, you know, back when I was in college and took journal some journalism classes, we were told to think about how the method of keeping notes also changes your own orientation as an interviewer. Um, when keeping handwritten notes, it kind of forces you to pay attention more and you end up remembering the interview better and kind of being more present in it, which might help you to kind of go off script and ask a good follow-up question or to find the next, you know, skip ahead to the next question that makes the most sense. Whereas recording, you might kind of be a little bit more tuned out. Um, if you, But maybe it'd be good to do a combination of both. Um, always consider having some kind of backup. So if you were doing like a video recording of the interview, have an audio recording going as well. Um, and I've had that happen. Um, I have a research project where we conducted interviews with 30 people at an institute and two or three of those interviews the technology went really awry and we were really glad that we had an audio backup going at the same time. Um, keep in mind that having some kind of recording device going as well is going to require um, extra written permission from your in order for it to it's generally good I would say it's it's generally a good uh, what do I want to say procedure um, to um, get written permission from your participants when you're going to have a video recording or audio recording of some kind. Um, some do's and don'ts for thinking about conducting interviews. Um, you definitely want to pick a quiet and also a neutral environment. You want to make sure everybody's comfortable. Being in one person's house, for instance, unless you already have a personal relationship, is probably going to feel really uncomfortable versus um, being somewhere like, you know, uh, outside, for instance, you can find a quiet area outside somewhere um, or in a public place. Um, a good place actually that has really good soundproofing, if you are recording, is a car, believe it or not, because cars, um, they try to insulate them from road noise. So that can actually be a really good place to conduct an interview. Um, you want to start with, you know, you're both regular humans and it's important to understand that even though you're conducting research. So start with some small talk to set everyone at ease, you know, and kind of get everybody comfortable. Um, you know, you'd be surprised how important that is to do. Um, always come prepared, but also don't think that you rigidly have to stick to a script. Um, it's okay to kind of jump around a bit. I will also say though that the jumping around a bit is definitely a skill that takes a little bit of practice. Um, you know, you'll be surprised at how, you know, like rushed you might feel kind of finding your next question once they're kind of finished answering. Um, so interviewing is something um, that's definitely good to practice and we'll be, we'll be doing our best to kind of practice a little bit um, together in class. Um, pay close attention to what they're saying so you can ask follow-up questions, ask them to explain something more. Um, and also, you know, I think a really big rule of thumb is not to jump in too soon. Um, let the interview breathe. So 
I have found that if you kind of just sit very quietly and show um, physical, like visual signs that you're listening, you know, nodding your head, making eye contact, um, if you resist the urge to jump in the second there is a, bre a bit of silence, you'll probably find that your interviewee will keep talking longer than you expected them to, and they might get somewhere really interesting or useful. So do your best not to jump in too quickly and cut, off, cut them off because they may feel kind of compelled to fill the silence. So give it like a, a couple seconds, 1, 1,000, 2, 1,000, 3, 1,000, before you jump back in with your next question. Um, and if the convers if you feel like the conversation starts to drift, you know, try using follow up questions to get things back on track. Um, and I have a handout that um, I will be posting to Blackboard uh, with some um, tips on crafting good interview questions. Surveys, another primary research method. Um, for a survey, you want to think about who you're going to survey and how and when. If you survey on paper, um, that's going to change how you're able, how and when you're able to interact with people versus over the internet. Um, it's sometimes easier if you're using like a paper survey you're conducting in person to get someone to persist and complete it versus if you do it over the internet, sometimes attention spans wander. Um, that's one thing to think about. Um, on, you might also think about how it's easier to get people who you kind of know or at least like you can convince your, you know, have some kind of investment in what you're doing. Um, if you have some kind of interaction with them, it's usually easier to get them to answer questions than some random stranger walking down the street, right? Um, think about how long your survey is going to be. You don't want it to um, really, again, really tax somebody. On the other hand, you want to make sure that it's long enough that you're getting good information. Um, when crafting survey questions, um, you want to think about the benefits of open-ended or descriptive kinds of questions that ask for a short response of some kind, whether it's a few words or whether there's like a small text box for them to write a few sentences, um, and also closed questions, which are yes, no, or like a multiple choice, simple answer kind of question. Both have their benefits. Um, you know, a open-ended, you can also think about how um, that gets combined with a closed question um, in, in providing an other category. Um, oh, and closed, here, here's a few I forgot. Um, in addition to multiple choice and like a yes, no, you can also rank choices, right? Rank the five things most, rank the following five things in the order of what's most important to you. Um, indicate how much you agree with this statement on a scale from one to six, that kind of thing. Um, and, you know, they have different uses. Um, an open-ended question allows you to get more detailed nuance like you kind of would get with an interview, um, whereas a closed question allows you to um, compile statistics, right? 96% of respondents or 7 out of 10 respondents answered yes, you know, that kind of thing. So they allow you to quantify things. Um, sometimes a mix is really nice, um, using one or two open-ended questions to follow up on and elaborate on closed questions. Um, and again, I'll have a little bit more on that in my handout that will be posted to Blackboard. Um, so the next section is on research ethics, but before we go there, I just want to quickly summarize what we've looked at. So we looked at three kinds of primary research, observation, interview, and survey. And I want you to spend some time thinking about what the benefits are of each. Observation allows you to see kind of what's going on in real time and observe it for yourself and make concrete observations. Whereas if you rely on asking someone to recount what happened, you're only getting their viewpoint of it, right? And they may forget things or they may not be noticing the same things that you would be noticing. So observation is good for getting like a real first-hand look at what's going on. Um, interviews are great for understanding somebody's perspective, for understanding how they feel about something or what it felt like to experience something, um, for getting a lot of detail. Uh, so getting kind of a personal story about something. And surveys are great, you know, again, for kind of getting a, an overview, a survey, if you will, right? Um, how things break down, how um, things compare within a group. 
So they all have benefits um, and, and things that they're better at showing and things that they're not as good at showing. So you want to think about that when choosing your research methods. So now I want to talk quickly about some basic research ethics, how we negotiate our own biases, um, consent from participants, representation, and reciprocity. So you always want to explain your project and ask permission um, when you are conducting research of some kind. Um, so, you know, introducing yourself briefly if you're, when you're doing an observation, obvious, um, and asking if it's okay if you hang out and observe things. Um, sometimes it can be really helpful to make contact with, like, a leader of, of the group um, so that they can kind of do some of this beforehand, maybe forward something through email from you or text message. Um, but you always want to explain your project explain what you're doing and ask permission. You're also probably going to find that that helps you as a researcher because when you've explained the project, then people may be more trusting and feel more comfortable around you. Um, you also especially want to ask for permission if participants um, can reasonably expect privacy at a research site. So, you know, if this was, for instance, um, I know a student who um, did a pro their project on... Um, I think it was like a dodgeball league or something, and they played it um, in uh, Nippert Stadium. And, um, you know, this is something that any person walking through campus could have sat down in the stands and watched happen. Um, so that's not necessarily a site where you have a lot of reasonable expectations of privacy. But let's say it's a meeting in a room with the door closed and the meeting's location was only announced through an internal email um, announcement. That is an example of something where they could reasonably expect to have privacy. And so that's a situation where you absolutely want to ask permission. And that doesn't have to be complicated. It's just so much as, is it okay if I sit here? Is it okay if I record this? Does anyone you know, feel uncomfortable if I record this? But it's important to do. Sharing your writing with your participants is a really great practice um, so that especially if anyone's feeling uncomfortable um, for interview participants, this is something that I do often, um, you know, and occasionally they say, wow, I can't believe I kind of said that. Do you think you could leave that one small little thing out that I said because I don't think it's not quite what I meant to say and I don't want to hurt anybody's feelings. It's a good opportunity to help people, you know, make sure that, that everything's on the up and up. Um, you want to keep your participants anonymous. Um, you know, if you think about like investigative journalism, a lot of times they'll change like people's first names. Um, that's a good practice. Um, you want to make sure that descriptions don't out somebody. So, you know, if there's only one person of a certain race in this group and you describe everybody's race, then that's clearly going to out that person, right? Um, keeping them anonymous is just a good way to make sure that they don't keeping people anonymous just make sure that nobody suffers harm uh, based on the project. And we want to be sensitive to potential harm. Um, the con reading talked about, um, you know, really extreme examples like when some participants found a notebook and found out that like so-and-so was cheating on so-and-so's girlfriend. Um, that's a really extreme example, but we always want to think about how our research might make people look badly or harm relationships they have with others and be sensitive to mitigating that as much as possible. And last, we also want to think about reciprocity, and that means a reciprocal relationship or how can we make sure that this research doesn't only benefit us, the people conducting it, how might it also benefit the participants? Um, you know, maybe that means you find a research site and you're not sure what topic you want to look into, but you talk to some people within that group about, you know, something that they might be looking for help with. And maybe you find that you can, you know, conduct your research by, and look into that particular area they need help with. Um, maybe it just means um, that you share the writing with them afterward and they can use it in some way that helps them later down the road. It might also be difficult to see at first how you're how your research helps them, and that's okay, but we want to do our best to make sure it's not a one-sided relationship. We can also, we talked a little bit about positioning your research. In other words, triangulating our research. You may remember I had that um, uh, diagram where we talked about how um, we as researchers are positioned within, but also outside of the community, how our observations may or may not align with um, 
viewpoints held by the community, viewpoints held by outside researchers. Um, so after conducting an observation, part of your job in order to be as ethical as possible is to go back and reflect on it. Is everyone being represented in your account as generously and fairly as you possibly can? Um, and that's something the con reading really touched on, right, with his example about the, um, you know, observations he conducted um, in a, another teacher's classroom and how he had, you know, a lifelong falling out with that teacher as a result of that and how if he'd gone back and reflected on that properly, maybe he would have seen how he could look at the situation in another light. Um, you want to try your best to ask neutral questions and... Um, see your findings as objectively as possible. So again, trying to separate concrete observations from more abstract interpretations. And last, try to keep as much context as possible. Um, you don't want to, because sometimes when we strip away context, um, interactions end up being misrepresented. And um, same with things that happen or are said in interviews. So you always want to make sure everything is as set up as possible. Um, again, with your data analysis, um, we've talked a little bit about being aware of potential biases in your thinking or logic, and in fact, one thing I'll ask you to do when coming up with some ideas for your topic is to think about what investments you already have in that community, what you already think about it, what relationships you already have within it. Um, and uh, the website linked here actually has a great, um, it's a great visual list of potential biases in thinking and logic that can affect how we look at data. Um, for instance, um, confirmation bias is when we look to data and we have a really clear idea of what we want the outcome to be, and then we end up kind of in subtle ways we may not even notice, kind of twisting the data to help it match our preconceived ideas. Part of what will help safeguard against, and that's just one example of many, um, I have a pop-up link here for you to click to um, read more about these. Um, part of what can safeguard against these kinds of flaws in logical thinking is to, again, go into ethnographic research, go into this kind of research, not thinking about what you think the ultimate outcome will be, but looking at the data and saying, what do I think this shows? What do I think this says? And trying to see it as objectively as possible. Um, also, don't, you know, try too hard to, um, you know, really, like, draw out conclusions. Focus on the patterns you're seeing. What is What do you see this data kind of saying? Um, and, again, research is messy. You might find that the original research question you went into this project with um, just kind of ends up bearing no relationship to what is important to say and what you kind of end up drawing out of it. Because sometimes we do research and we find out, oh, my first idea was a complete dead end, but I've got this new idea now based on what I'm seeing here. Be honest about your findings and don't twist things around to meet your original research question. That's not the goal. The goal is to see what the data tells you. Um, so hopefully this gives you some stuff to think about. What I want you to start doing is thinking about potential topics for your research and potential methods that you'll be using uh, in order to conduct it. Um, and that's going to help you get a jump start on the research proposal and also on the methods workshop that we'll do um, in coming days in the course where I will ask you to share survey or interview questions with each other um, and start looking at how you can put those together in the most effective way.